Welcome to The Unconventional Path, Entrepreneurship and Innovation Stories and Ideas. Hi, I'm Bela Musitz. And I'm Mike Wasserman. Today, we are excited to be joined by Redis Loris. Redis is CEO and co-founder of Omnisend, a company that provides e-commerce support for small and medium-sized companies. Redis tells his story of his journey from having a marketing consulting business to developing a product that manages communications between e-commerce companies and their customers. This story is really exciting because along the way, he talks about falling down and picking himself up and keeping going forward. So it's going to be a great story. I hope you guys will listen. Yep, but before we begin, Bela, we'd like to share with our listeners that our podcast is brought to you in part by the law firm of Phillips Lytle LLP. This is a sponsorship that makes a lot of sense to us, Bela. You know this firm well, don't you? I sure do. I have worked with the key entrepreneurship partners at Phillips Lytle for over 20 years. Their attorneys take an entrepreneurial approach to legal matters, and they have a long history of success with startups. We thank Phillips Lytle for their support of the entrepreneurial community and their sponsorship of the Unconventional Path podcast. Thanks, Bela. And with that, let's move to the interview with Ritas Loris. Hello, listeners, and welcome to this week's podcast. My guest today is Ritas Loris, uh, who is a very successful entrepreneur and has built a company called Omnisend. And uh, we're going to talk about that in uh, pretty good depth today. So welcome to the show, Ritas. Hey, Bella, nice to meet you here. Thanks for inviting. Yeah, sure. Very good. So let me ask you my first question. If you are at a social event, so not an industry event, but sort of a social event uh, that's not industry related, and uh, you go up to somebody and you introduce yourself and they ask you the question, what do you do? How do you answer that question? Oh, that's a very good question because not only in social events, but telling my friends, telling my relatives what do I do, uh, sometimes is a bit challenge. So uh, I would say we help uh, those who sell online, those who run their e-commerce stores, uh, we help them to communicate with their customers via email, text messages, web push notification, Facebook, WhatsApp, and all those channels. So that would be my basic pitch outside the e-commerce or marketing industry. Yeah, very nice. And do you do that in a consultative manner or do you have a set of standard products? This is a standard product, what's what's called like software as a service. So basically it's all online. You just create your account uh, online. Uh, you start using it. You connect with your store and then you use all the benefits of, uh, of the tool. We don't do consultants a service outside just helping customers to onboard and properly use the tool. Sure, sure. And uh, so if I run, uh, what's your sweet spot? What's, what's the best, the, you know, what, for what type of customers is your sweet spot? So starting from really, really beginner ones who just launched their online store, let's say on Shopify, BigCommerce, WooCommerce, Magento, any, any of those platforms, we have seamless integrations with those. So it's really easy to start using companies. And, and we have free plan for the beginners with uh, like basic feature set there. So starting from the real, real beginner to, I would say like uh, 30, 40 millions in GMB, we are not focusing on enterprise level customers. We're mainly focusing on like small and medium, medium sized customers. We have started the, our business focusing uh, ex- exclusively on like smaller ones. Uh, now we are growing alongside with our customers and we really, uh, are able to serve mid-size, mid-size online stores, uh, mid-size e-commerce businesses. Yeah, so that's that. That is our sweet spot, and this is the 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 type of businesses for whom we create the most of the value. Excellent. You know, it really is amazing how how the internet has basically enabled almost anyone to start a business, and and with the you know the distribution networks, i.e., uh, the shipping uh, uh, channels that are available to us. You can sell to anybody in the world. And so the opportunities are endless, And which is the good news. The challenge, of course, is that anyone can do it. So there's a lot of competition. So I take it that one of the things you would help a customer do is sort of help uh, uh, promote their brand, promote their products, and get them out in front of customers. So how do you specifically do that? Yeah, so this is a very good point. Yeah, so that's what I love about uh, e-commerce 
in general, that it really opens endless opportunities. And what you said about the global, that really opens a global market, not even your local, what used to be with a brick and mortar, that you either have to own a chain, which requires huge investment, et cetera, or if you just open a local store, let's say you have only very local audience, people who are passing by your physical brick and mortar store. Uh, internet opens you a global market. And like us, Omnisend, we are a great example of, of that. We are we are born in Europe. The product is, is being born in Europe and Lithuania, uh, although the vast majority of our customers are in the United States. So it's, it's again, a, a great example of Internet uh, enabling us to create a business, enabling us to create a business anywhere in the world and have global audience. Uh, yeah, so I completely agree, and that's what I love about the industry. Um, the second part of the question, so how do we help uh, how do we enable those on online stores? So I would say we really help communicate with their existing customer base. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, promote. Of course, we, we do help to promote, but I, I, I prefer using like communication. It's really about talking with your customers, about uh, sending them uh, relevant messages on the relevant time and through the relevant channels and really allowing your customers to choose which channel they prefer to communicate with your brand. I it's email, uh, it's SMS, uh, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp in some of the countries, uh, web push notification. So all those channels are in one tool and it's up to the customer to make a decision which is the most preferred or which few of those are the most preferred channels to for the brand to communicate with the customer. And it's it's all actually about like uh, what is called retention marketing. So we don't we don't help to drive initial sales and initial initial traffic to your website, but it's very important to when just customers visits your website or your online store for the first time to really start thinking about how to retain that customer. Because usually on for e-commerce businesses, the first transaction, the first purchase the customer makes a uh, uh, negative. I mean, you lo you lose something, ROI negative. But uh, therefore, you need to, therefore you need to really retain those customers. Only the second, the third transaction, the customer becomes profitable. And uh, once you think about the lifetime value from the customer, so you have completely different perspective. And it's where really Omnisend helps to to convert those one-time buyers into into returning customers and uh, help them you know feel happier and send the messages you want them to receive. Yes. So if, uh, you know, if I have like an eBay store or an Amazon store or an Etsy store that I'm using to sell my products, uh, do you integrate with those and, and sort of how does that work? Yeah, so very good question. So in those cases, if you sell through uh, marketplaces and platforms like Amazon, Etsy or eBay, uh, they limit you and actually they don't let you own uh, your customer's data. Uh, so we work with brands who, uh, alongside with those marketplaces who have, uh, it might be alongside, maybe separately, but those who own their own online stores uh, on Shopify, e-commerce, uh, Magento, WooCommerce, any, any of those platforms. So basically you have to own your online store. That's how you are able to own your contacts. In the case of Amazon or Etsy, you just have a customer ID number, but you don't have either email address or phone number. They own your data, your customer's data, and they, uh, how to say, they rent your customer's data for you and you pay them for that. Mm -hmm. It's completely different when you own your brand, when you own your online store, you own all the channels and the, the where your customer emails or phone numbers, all those permissions to communicate with them become an, your own asset not rented one. Ah, uh, you know, I didn't know that. So that's, uh, that's, that's very Im important and in uh, information, right? Cause you, I've always learned, right. And being a business school professor, I always taught you want to own your customer. You want to have exactly. that, that direct link to your customer. So if I'm selling on some of these other platforms, uh, what you're saying is that I don't own that data. I may not have access, direct access to that customer for, follow-up that comes from me so that's some, correct some other platforms enable you to do that and those are the that's ones correct. that you're most engaged with yeah that's correct that's correct yeah because uh, amazon ebay etsy they limit you and there is no way to start owning the data so yeah. what i would recommend for all like uh, online businesses to combine i do understand that like e amazon and ebay etsy they 
they create great opportunities, in, especially for the at the starting point. Then uh, to drive the, the traffic independently to your online store is a challenging thing. It it costs money, and it's much easier to start your business on those platforms. But as the business grows, as this, you start getting more and more orders, uh, really the goal for 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 the store owner or for a store marketer would be uh, to to like transfer your like, loyal customers to your own brand and your own store. Yes, yes. So, uh, do you help me uh, uh, put together campaigns to to sort of go after my uh, customers, or or uh, again help yeah, me understand correct, yeah. sort of in, in a little bit more detail? Um, we provide a tool which helps you to to uh, to build campaigns, build uh, like uh, one-off campaigns, build automated campaigns, which is which is uh, the, the 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 great thing about that about uh, Omnisend or other tools like this is really that you can run automated campaigns. So basically, all of those are what what we do. We analyze your customers' behavior on your site or with uh, like interactions. If when did we buy? For how much do we buy? What what uh, products do we visit on your website? And based on that, there are like automated triggers. Let's say Bella was uh, looking at this specific phone, which this is a trigger which uh, shoots an automated campaign of let's say three emails and two text messages in the campaign. And uh, that's how we start automatic the campaign with a message which is really relevant for Bella, not promoting uh, winter tires, let's say, yes, yes. but promoting phone because you are interested in buying a new phone currently and we know from your behavior. So uh, that's that's kind of win-win situation. Uh, it's less less uh, less messy like from, from the online store and from the customers really you start getting much more relevant messaging from uh, from online store, which is really much more accepted. And, and that messaging, uh, remind me again, that messaging comes in sort of what what vehicles, email? Yeah, email, text message, uh, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, web push notifications. Yeah, so all those channels we, we support. Okay, got it, got it, very nice. Uh, so let's uh, let's go back a little bit and, and talk about the beginnings of this and, and sort of you growing up. Is there sort of an entrepreneurial or entrepreneurship history in your family? Uh, my my mom, she my, both of my parents they are they are doctors. Yeah, and my mom she's eye doctor, eye surgery, and she owns a small optic shop. Yeah, so there is there is a bit, and then I was teenager was really helping here with her business. So probably that was kind of. Uh, a beginning of entrepreneurial spirit in the Finnish family. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, a lot of professionals, whether they be lawyers or doctors, uh, if they open up their own practice, that's their own business. <laughs> so they are entrepreneurs. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. A lot of a lot of people yeah, don't think that way, but yeah. I do. I do agree. Yeah, because when when you start kind of uh, getting a salary, you need to really earn uh, on day over day, month over month. Yes. And and so did you go to university? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, I have graduated political sciences, which is nothing related to business, but I never, I spent a couple of years in that in that uh, field, let's say, but yeah, for a very short time. I, I, I launched my first business at, at the age of uh, 21, I believe. So kind of never have been employed properly employed since, since then I was running my own businesses uh, with someone, never did yes. like, on my own because I really am not the, the lonely wolf. I, I believe in partnership a lot. So yeah, usually I, I, I got someone to, to partner with and yeah. So what, what, what was that? Different. Yeah. What was that first business? First, first business. Oh, that was pretty long time ago. Uh, yeah, so de- depending on our listeners' age now, for some of them may even not understand, but it, it, like it was just the beginning of uh, feature phones where you were able to play the melody instead of the default ring. Uh, you could like download any song, which would sound uh, as, as a song, but actually it was a, a ring or like uh, screensavers, uh, color screensavers. So that was just the beginning of like... Uh, colored screens from, you know, black and white screens, etc. So, yeah, so basically you can download those with uh, sending text, text messages. There was a uh, WAP WAP protocol at that time. So, yeah, so 
creating those melodies and those screen savers and selling to them. That was the, the first the first business, which uh, one fellow of mine, he had just invited me to, to, uh, to launch this venture. And uh, I, I gladly took this, this chance. Um, yeah, actually, I had zero experience. Both of us had zero experience at that time. That was a really great uh, beginning of, uh, of uh, my entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. So, what was the what was the what were what was the number one thing that you learned from that experience? Uh, probably kind of, uh, uh, yeah. The, the the thing which I remembered up till now. So, all the taxes. Wow, I learned in the hard way. <laughs> Especially like VAT, VAT everywhere in the world is pretty complicated thing, and uh, yeah, all the taxation, all the reports uh, for for. All, governmental institution for like you know tax authorities etc so probably that's that was my key learning which i still remember up until now yeah so you were selling those around the world so there's all sorts of uh regulations associated with that including as you said taxes and revenue allocation and all those things and you're just a small business right it's two guys <laughs> and all of a sudden you have oh my god we have to deal with all this stuff <laughs> Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so that was kind of like bureaucracy layer, paperwork layer is just is pretty heavy on a, any business uh, anywhere in the world. Yeah. yeah. Although, like, yeah. So I have this kind of cross cross country experience, international experience. So uh, usually, when you are in one country, you think that the bureaucracy level at your country is super high, and everywhere else in the world is easier to do business. But when you go like abroad overseas, you find that everywhere in the world, unfortunately, you have this there. <laughs> yes, it's 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 everywhere, and it's just different flavors of the same stuff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, did you did you do another startup after that one? Uh, what what happened after that? Yeah, yeah. So th that initial business was, uh, I would say, kind of we we cover we paid some salaries, but that was not uh, like super successful. So, uh, and we sold it. So that was kind of an initial exit. Didn't, didn't make much fortune on that initial, uh, business. Yeah. And afterward, uh, I, I was, I was, uh, like in like some, uh, financial instance, like advisory and then like credit union. And, uh, so that was a bit different angle. So like, you know, from, uh, from, uh, cell phones and like, Careless stage of IT business, let's say, to, to financial industry, and then yeah, got back to to, to IT industry. So I I had a digital marketing agency from which actually we pivoted to what Omnisend is now. So as we saw the need of those online stores, who some of them were our customers, and we saw the very unique need and very unique opportunities to to provide them uh, the service to to help them to communicate with their customers. So that's how we pivoted from a digital marketing agency to, to the product. So uh, talk to me about how you recognized this need. So you're running a digital marketing agency, right? And then you did this pivot that you talk about. And I'm really interested in that, in sort of understanding how people sort of come, you know, recognize that opportunity and then say, you know what, we're going to, we're going to change lanes here and, and, and we're going to go do this other thing. So talk about that a little bit. Um, so I would say basically is really listening to, um, to your customers. It was not a first attempt. So we, uh, while running a digital marketing agency, we had two, two more like projects, which failed. Uh, first one is, was about, uh, uh that, that was a, a product again, very similar idea, like software as a service just for, uh, for doctors and like to, for appointment registration and appointment management. But at that time, market was not ready for that kind of tool. <clears throat> Basically, like doctors still relied on their paper, uh, paper, um, uh, you know, journals and and, uh, and, and, and and registering books. So uh, that was kind of an attempt. So we kind of saw that, okay, there is a need. The internet is coming everywhere and, and, and maybe maybe uh, the market is ready for that. But the market was not ready for that at that time. Uh, a second attempt was we launched um, a polling tool for events, seminars, and uh, it was called like IQ Pulse. And uh, and uh, yeah, and then any events when the presenter on the stage basically can easily communicate with an audience and ask us questions. So the, <clears throat> it uh, unfortunately it's failed as well. And uh, I learned very good lesson there that uh, once you build a product, you really have to uh, uh, 
solve the pain and find the monetizable customer pain. Because in that case, the product was a nice to have solution, but not must have solution. Uh, so as we gave someone for free, uh, everybody was gladly using it. But then we asked to pay for that. Nobody has, was willing to pay for that. And uh, yeah, and it's an opposite with Omnisend currently because we really help businesses to to earn more, which is a purpose of business. So uh, of so of any business. So that's exactly where we create a direct value for businesses. Therefore, they are willing to share some of that value with uh, service providers. We are. So yeah. So basically, all those free attempts were kind of uh, just you know looking at the market, listening to the customers you're already dealing with. Uh, so Omnisend because we were serving some of online stores and we saw that okay uh, they have they have much more data than other businesses do because their business starts and uh, and uh, up all the way up to the conversion it is purely online so you can track a lot you can identify a lot you can listen to a lot of signals which your customers uh, uh, provide you so yeah so that was kind of uh, initial initial thought and we talked to some of our customers would you find a need and we kind of confirmed the idea and uh, yeah, so basically that that was yeah listening to the market and making some bets. I mean, even even you listen to a market, sometimes you can fail. As I just gave a couple of examples. Yeah, yeah, very true. And uh, so, how long has uh, OmniSend been around as a business? Uh, six years now. Yeah, as, as a product, I would say so. Uh, initial couple of years, we were still uh, pretty much earning money from uh, digital marketing. Uh, activities and investing them into into Omnisend product. So, and I would say it turned like into a business, like generating revenue. And then we ditched our agency activities four years, a bit more than four years ago. Yeah, and and what have been sort of the biggest challenges in in starting and growing this business? I would say it's always the biggest challenge. Uh, in starting and in growing, really to really, really understand your customer's needs and to reflect them properly. Uh, listen to customers, understand them, and really to, to create the value they want you to create. Yes. So how, how, do, how do you do that? How do, how, does, how do you do that to understand your customer needs? Uh, so it's, it's basically a combination of two. As in our case, we have like uh, tens of thousands of online stores using, using Omnisense. So it's, uh, one is uh, kind of a more massive way. Uh, so when you collect, uh, you collect feedback uh, while just basically asking people. So NPS surveys, uh, support team, which after like, you know, reporting each ticket, if someone came with a question, how to do this or that. So probably they just don't find it in the product. They don't understand how to do it. Sometimes customers outreach and say, okay, how can I accomplish this? And uh, we don't have, we can't help in that case. So it's all being registered. It's all being uh, grouped systemized and basically that's how we define our role it's the first thing second thing is really the feedback coming from uh, sales uh, and customer like account like customer success teams those who have like direct interaction with, with potential or existing customers who just basically talk to them um, so yeah they, they provide feedback as well and uh, and the, the third thing so with a larger customers we time to time we have like direct like interviews just talking about how do they run their business uh, what challenges do they face um, how do they address those challenges uh, even sometimes outside our scope just to really understand what are they worried about what are they happy about in general and finding the ways how can we help them to overcome their challenges yes so as as i reflect on what you just said you you have sort of divided this you have your existing customers and, and you want to make sure they're happy and you listen to them. And then you have uh, potential new customers that you're trying to understand their needs. And, and so, and you sort of have a process for collecting that information and data. And as a, as the, as a founder, entrepreneur, a senior leader in this business, how often do you review that information? Um, so again, this company grows being honest. I do it, uh, less than they used to do yeah so now we are around 70 people uh so so there are already processes and people who are responsible for that and in in our case in our organization uh, i have co-founder who is responsible for product so he does it on daily basis he really knows all the needs he knows what what we are good at where maybe we we should uh, improve 
so yeah, so how to say, uh, in our organization, it's not me kind of personally responsible, but definitely I believe that one of the founders being uh, in charge of that, it's, it's crucially important for organization. So in our case, uh, there is my co-founder who is on daily basis on that. Yes. And, and now you guys are clearly an international business uh, selling all over the world. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. We, we have at least one, like at least one paying customer we have from more than 130 countries. Wow. Wow. So, so really, really international. Yeah. So what have been some of the challenges of, I mean, we, we touched on that a little bit before, uh, but what are some of the challenges in sort of establishing a worldwide business? Um, so I would say two, two, two main challenges. First is really uh, cultural differences. Uh, they do exist. Fortunately or unfortunately, then no, but they do exist and really do uh, uh, like running business in like uh, small countries versus large countries, uh, north versus south, and east, east versus west. So those those cultural differences they do exist, and you have to understand. In our in our case, what unites all of our customers is really that they all run e-commerce businesses. So we kind of have a common language about that specific. Um, business case and that specific industry, uh, which is which is good, which helps us to, to really find the common common language and to understand. It's the first thing. Second thing, it's uh, probably uh, similar to what uh, ha- I have already mentioned, what I have learned from my first uh, venture is really all the taxation and all that, um, all that bureaucratic stuff, which does exist and every country wants. Uh, taxes to be paid for them, not to another country. So, <laughs> how, how to properly manage that and and to satisfy everybody and yeah, not to abuse some local regulations, which are sometimes completely opposite to what are regulations in another country. Yeah, yeah. So it, you're doing business in in well over a hundred countries. Uh, so when it comes to uh, let's say support for your customers. You, you have a hundred different languages <laughs> or, or, you know, some, <laughs> you, you have a large number of different languages. How do you sort of manage that and deal with that? So in terms of languages, we have only one, uh, it's English only. So I wish, and this is my, my uh, kind of dream one day to be able to support many, many different languages. But up until now we do support English only. And yeah, this is this is a very very huge effort to support different languages, starting from the product itself, which has to be properly translated, then all the knowledge base, all the enablement thing, all like support people, as we provide twenty four seven support, so anytime, anytime <clears throat> uh, of the year, including all the biggest celebrations, someone is there to help. Uh, but yeah, we do English only, and uh, uh, but again, like. Uh, uh, the, the market, uh, the, the e-commerce and like uh, marketing, marketers industry, or those two verticals, so more or less people speak English all yes. over the place. Yes, yes. So uh, as you look out into your crystal ball and into the future, uh, how do you see sort of e-commerce changing? So I would say that the major trend is really e-commerce uh, will drop an e-letter uh, in the front as it's really becoming omni-channel. So that's what we strongly believe, and that's the trend which already in the market for a few years, it's not happening as fast as probably some of experts have predicted um, five years ago, but that's definitely the direction it is going. So basically the boundaries between between offline and online, between what we traditionally call retail and e-commerce are melting, and those are really, uh, are really, uh, really being blended all together. And uh, I strongly believe that in the future, us customers will be able to purchase in any way which is the most convenient for us. It can be like, you know, ordering something online and going to fit in the uh, offline showroom or in, in, in vice versa, going to offline showroom and having all the available colors, all the available sizes, which usually is not the case nowadays. I mean, I like this color, but I don't have the size. They, they don't have a size of me. So there will be just one one piece of everything, if we're talking about, let's say, clothing, and I, I will be able to fit, and I will be able to order it, and it will be delivered the same day to my doors. 
at home at office anywhere and like yeah all adding all the social media channels that if i see the product which i like i can like buy it instantly from there and it will be delivered to to my to to my house or maybe i can pick it in a train station if i commute let's say on a daily basis or whatever like somewhere in the grocery store so uh, we believe this is this is the, the direction where commerce in general is is heading to yes Yes, and and that again makes it uh, uh, more available, but more challenging for the individual entrepreneur to sort of sell their products. Right? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. It's a bit more challenging. So, uh, like the tools like ours. So again, what we as as the commerce is going there. So we believe that uh, the communication channels should be omni-channel as well, and we have to have this omni-channel approach that anywhere you want, uh, anyone you as a customer, I mean, want. To, to, for brands to, to communicate with you, so you should be able to, to choose your own channel, which is the most preferred for you. So there are definitely tools in the market which help entrepreneurs to, to do this uh, omni-channel, omni-channel commerce, followed by omni-channel marketing, followed by omni-channel product distribution, uh, stock management, etc. So you just need to pick proper tools, and it will not be, how do you say, it will not be uh, more difficult than just five years ago to run any online store. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, where, again, remind me where you're, uh, located, where the company's located, headquartered. Yeah. So he- headquarter we, we have like three, three major locations. So one is, uh, yeah, company's headquartered in London, UK. Uh, we have, uh, R and D office where the product is being built uh, in uh, Lithuania, Vilnius, Lithuania. And off in Europe, and yeah, we we just opened our office in the United States four or five months ago. So although we had like vast majority of our businesses coming from the U.S. for quite many years already, but we didn't have physical representation here in the U.S. up until now. Now we do have already eight people in the U.S. They are distributed, for working basically remotely. But uh, but yeah, so we are building here physical representation, and and yeah, starting starting to work more closely with our especially larger customers yes like, very nice partners yeah. so what, what type of challenges has that brought to you in other words starting in lithuania then opening an office in the uk and now one in the united states having employees in different countries what are some of the challenges there so probably i would call it's kind of remote uh, <laughs> this is the keyword to <laughs> describe all of those uh, all of those challenges so um Nowadays, an internet really brought and like video chats, which I kind of really, really disrupted how people do organize uh, uh, their daily job activities. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, probably this is this is kind of a key challenge to really find the way how to how to people uh, in different countries in different time zones sometimes really really. Now we have the most like ten hours difference between our employees. Uh, so, uh, that's the most radical difference. So really to find ways for them to still cooperate, still, uh, feel, uh, being in, in the same boat, still, uh, like, you know, how do you say playing in the same team and then accomplishing, uh, common goals and then results, sharing results, sharing victories, celebrating victories and then improving things when they're not going well, etc. So probably that's, that's the key challenge. On the other hand, it's the key opportunity as well, because you are like kind of opened for a global talent pool. You should not be looking for someone locally uh, without experience, you can you can hire someone who is anywhere in the world and has already you know experience in the field you need um, her or him to have this experience, etc. So uh, yeah, so I see both challenges and huge opportunities here as well. Yeah, yeah. Are there when you're speaking of hiring? So when you're evaluating a potential employee, are there certain things that you tend to look for? You have certain biases for things that you've learned over the years. I would say cultural fit. That's the key key thing. Uh, we really we will build a friendly, supportive uh, organization, open organization where everybody's uh, talking to each other. Uh, we share like a lot of data, like business data, with everyone within the company, uh, and the like openness culture, open culture, and 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 then like friendly, like really the. We are kind of 70 now, and the team is growing pretty fast. So, uh, so we want everybody to feel and really act as a team player. 
as a part of a team. Yeah. Uh, not not to be too selfish. Uh, I mean, you have to be a little bit. You have to to fight for own your own results, let's say. But yeah, as I always keep saying, you know, we are something similar as a sport team. Uh, you can become MVP just if you are playing for a winning team. So that's the only way really to be the most recognized, even on the individual level. That's okay. Be egoistic, you know, but uh, the MVP is only being selected from a winning team. So if the team wins, it's very good for all of us. If a team loses, you can be the best player in the losing team. Nobody cares about you. Uh, yeah, so I would say the cultural fit is the key key factor, and of course, then it's being followed by by like skills, which uh, we need in that specific role. But this is a secondary thing. Yeah, yeah. And early, you mentioned that uh, you tend not to be a lone wolf, but you sort of like partnerships and partners. So, um, uh, how many co-founders do you have for this business? So we had two main co-founders, and we have some early employees who who had stock options. Some of them have converted. Some of them have already. Sure. Some of yeah. Some of them are still still uh, have options open. So yeah. So we had two two main co-founders. Uh, which actually this is an interesting story because my current co-founder used to be my customer in my previous business. <laughs> so that's how we met each other and how found the common values. And I really, I'm really super happy about that. That you know, this uh, service provider customer relationship we were able to transform into into a great partnership. Yeah, yeah. And how do the two of you sort of uh, divide up responsibilities, and how is decision making done between the two of you? So in the early days, that was more 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 blended, and we kind of both were involved in almost everything. Now it's more 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 clear. So my co-founder Eustace, he's responsible for for product. So building a world-class product and uh, and listening to customer needs, uh, reflecting them uh, like with developers, product managers, design stuff, and all that, all that, all that field. Uh, on my end, I'm responsible for business development and and uh, like running a company, like in, in general, like all the financials. Uh, people management, etc. Of course, I don't do it anymore on my own, like personally, but this is my field of responsibility for to have enough enough uh, people uh, to, 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 to do things, to, to keep them happy, to, to salaries to be paid and, and business to like to have enough customers to use the product which is being built uh, by our great product team. Yeah, yeah, very nice. And, and how did the, he said he, you said he was your customer. So you sort of yes. knew each other in that uh, customer relationship, and and did you like sit down uh, at a have a beer one night and say, hey, we should start this business together? But take me through that sort of process. Yeah, so for sure, like beer and coffee was involved. Yeah, <laughs> into a kind of finding common values. Ah, uh, that's a very good question. That was not like one. There was no one kind of you know aha moment. Uh, it was iterative, just start talking about things. So, uh, he was the founder of uh, another business. I was a founder. So just starting like meeting and just sharing uh, experience about <clears throat> how to run business and uh, and the values. And we kind of start finding that, okay, there are uh, a lot of mutual things which we share. And probably like, the, the key thing was really uh, the, the, the ambition and, and to build an international business. Uh, so, because both of the businesses were at that time pretty local, ones. so um, yeah, so probably that that was a thing, and we started thinking about okay, so w- w- where are the opportunities here? So, and basically building the product, or like uh, software as a service business, as we're doing now, as what I'm saying is, is probably what was the the, the, the largest opportunity to build an international business, uh, which is really have no physical boundaries. Yeah. Oh, very, very nice. And and how long did that sort of process take before you decided, okay, we're actually going to do this? Mm. Oh, that's, I would say probably kind of, that was a journey. So, and I have mentioned that we had like a couple of more like product, building a product attempt. So yeah, it was already done together with him. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I believe before launching on this end, we kind of like a couple of years. Yeah. We had yeah. two, it, it took, it took time. I mean, it was not like again, done in a week or month. 
Right. There was not a eureka moment. <laughs> where oh, all, no. yeah. Okay. yeah, 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 yeah. That was yeah. That was more kind of a, a journey, not not one-off event. Yeah, yeah. you or eureka moment. Yeah. So. Very good. Uh, so if uh, if a first-time entrepreneur or or someone who wants to be an entrepreneur came to you uh, and said, uh, "Rita, uh, give me some advice. What what would your advice be to them?" Just start doing things. Mm -hmm. uh, just do it. I mean, this is a promotional slogan of one of the companies, <laughs> but they really like it. Uh, usually people are, are thinking too much instead of doing more. Uh, I, I don't say that you should not be thinking. You should be doing things smart, uh, but you should be doing. Without doing, you will never accomplish anything. So execution is very, very important. So just start doing now. Uh, start making mistakes as soon as you can. Start learning from your mistakes, uh, fixing things, and that's the only way to go. In any industry, in any business, that's what I strongly believe. You cannot learn lessons, although I read a lot. I mean, I love reading, but you cannot uh, learn things in theory if you are not able to apply things in practice. Uh, so like books, uh, seminars, uh, like lectures can help you much more if you can apply what you learn immediately, if you have already made some mistakes and you can improve things. So just start doing immediately and start making mistakes, fixing them fast, be fast. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the only way to make a progress and yeah that's what i constantly keep saying for my team strive for progress not perfection yeah that's uh that's great 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 advice uh it's been a, a real pleasure having you on the podcast um is there is there something that i should have asked you that i have not asked you about the business or about you or your background that you'd like to share uh yeah we have covered like uh everything so it really really uh been been a great pleasure to talk to you and went through from, uh, my personal journey as well as cover uh, what we are currently doing yes and even some recall some moments which uh, I didn't think that much in nowadays how, how I met my co-founder so so yeah more or less more or less we have covered everything so thank you for having me on your show yeah you're very welcome you've been a great guest and I really enjoyed speaking with you today thank you likewise, likewise. thanks Bella Bella that was a great interview this is a really interesting journey, uh, and it's a c classic kind of story of uh, entrepreneurs that that uh, have this passion in them and have this expertise, and they want to figure out the way that works, and they fail along the way. Um, what was your takeaway from the journey that Redis was on? So I think one of the things that, that really struck me was he talked about first couple of products he built were not very good. They were, I, th I think, I'm not sure he used the word awful, but I, I think you could read between the lines and, and that's what he was implying. But, you know, th he learned from that. So this notion of sort of uh, trying something, putting it out into the marketplace, and then learning from that experience, and then modifying and building upon that. Um, you know, it, it, it reminded me of sort of, you know, watching a toddler learn how to walk. Man, in the beginning, they sure fall down a lot. Uh, but they're very persistent. They learn from that. Uh, they move forward. And I think this was a very similar type of notion the, that Wright has talked about a lot. It's just sort of start, fail, learn, and then restart. And I think that's, that's really important uh, for entrepreneurs. You're not going to hit the ball out of the park on your first swing at bat uh, or use whatever analogy you want, but you got to keep persistent at it and, and, and moving forward and learning, right? Um, not just picking yourself up and doing the same thing over and over again, but, but taking a second to reflect back and say, okay, what did our customers not like about this? That may mean you may need to call some of them up and say, hey, what's going on? And you know, I, of, I often think that's a difficult thing for us to do because we don't want to listen to people sort of criticize our our product or our service. Uh, but if people are not buying it or they're stop, stop using it, man, you better go figure out why, because that's where there's a tremendous amount of learning value there. 
but I think our general tendency is to say, no, 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 I just want to hang around with people who say what we do is really great. Well, you can learn so much from, from hanging around or talking to people who say, you know what, your product isn't that good. I'm using this other thing instead, and this other thing's a lot better for me. Well, dive down and try to understand that, learn from it, turn it, in, turn it into a learning experience. And you know what? That customer who's not using your product right now is also going to feel really good to say, oh my gosh, these guys really care. They actually called me up because that doesn't happen very often. So I think there's benefits. Uh, there's multiple benefits from doing things like that. How about you, Mike? Yeah, I agree. You know, the flip side of this is that sometimes also your customers change. So as the customer's need change, the product that you originally designed doesn't work. And you're not going to know that unless you talk with them. So, yeah. And, you know, it's a little awkward. It's like, you know, you went out on a date and you didn't get a second date, right? The person said no. And, you, you know, you can just go sit and uh, hide in your room and watch Netflix, right? Or, you know, some people say, okay, what was it, right? I mean, just curious, right? What, what, what was it? Was it just not a good match or was there something that I did or I said or whatever? And maybe you'll get some feedback and maybe you won't, but it's awkward. But as an entrepreneur, you really have to do that, right? You really have to figure out why your customers don't want to buy your product or don't want to buy your service. And that's just critical, critical information. Because if it's a small group of people that, as you said, say yes, and I love what you do, but that's not indicative of the rest of the customer base, you're going to invest a lot of money and lose a lot of money. So yeah, I love this idea of really trying to get customer feedback. And I, I, I really do. If you think about his target market, uh, are these small businesses and this idea of the fact that their needs change over time is really important because when they're just launching, I mean, he told this kind of great story about how, yeah, they should be using Amazon or Shopify to test their market, to test their concept, to validate on the fly, to try to self-fund their future kind of um, uh, operations through cash flow, all things that you and I have talked about a few different times on this podcast over the last year and a half. Uh, but then at some point, those companies control the relationship that you have with your customers. Those companies control the flow of data back and forth. And this is where he saw his in, right? His ability to say, okay, let me pull that control back and give that control to small businesses so that once they're off that kind of incubation stage where they're using other people's platforms and not having control of their own data, ah, now I need to manage that relationship myself. And that's really where he saw this need. And, you know, in the early days of e-commerce and, and, and not that long ago, really, um, people weren't really aware of this. And now as the times change and customers' needs change, he's designed this product that really works. So I thought that was great. Yeah. You know, it, it sort of reminded me of back early in my career, uh, one of the companies I started, we, in the beginning, uh, we did not have a direct sales force. So we hired uh, independent reps, as they were called. Uh, who basically sold our product. And they sold other products as well. And there, as we grew, uh, it dawned on us, we didn't know who our customers were, right? It was the independent reps who owned that customer relationship, right? Because they were sort of the middleman between us and the customer. Uh, so it was difficult to learn from our customer. It was difficult to have a conversation with them because we did not have direct access. And I think what uh, Redis is talking about is directly analogous to that, right? In the e-commerce space. So there is, there is a time where, where you want to know your customer. You want to own that relationship. You want to be able to communicate directly with them. You want to be able to engage with them. And I think this is the, maybe the next thing that's going to happen here in sort of the e-commerce space where people are going to start realizing this is more and more important uh, as these markets mature and the companies mature and they're going to want to control and, and keep this data. Agreed. And, you know, this idea of the communication channel between a company and its customers is absolutely critical. And as more and more everything moves towards online, and, and really, if you think about even how we communicate online, it was email, right? And now it's more these short bits of information, these, you know, SMS size and tweets and, and WhatsApp size communication that makes it even harder to really control that message and really get across what you want to get across, whether it's your value proposition, your offer, right? All of these things are really critical. So I, I think it's a, it's a really big need uh, that companies like this are, 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 are filling. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. You know, the other thing that I thought was, that was very interesting that he said was this notion of strive for progress, not perfection, Right. 
and I and and you see this particularly in sort of technologically based companies. Oftentimes, uh, you know, the the product is always six weeks away from being ready, uh, and it's six weeks away from being ready for five years. Uh, so they never quite introduce it because they can always improve improve it. That's true. You can always improve it, but at some point in time, you got to draw the line in the sand and say. This is the this is the feature set we're going to have. We're going to introduce it to our customers, and we're going to get feedback. And the reason I think that's extremely important is you will learn so much more by putting that product out there and having customers use it and then garnering their feedback than you ever will by having you and your team continue to develop it inside of the four walls of your business, right? So the sooner you get it out there, the better off you are, the more you're going to learn, the more opportunities you have to learn and improve your product. And it goes back to this whole concept of the minimum viable product, right? Trying to figure out what that minimum viable product is and get it, get it out there and get feedback. Find out which features customers like, which features customers are less enthusiastic about. And so it gives you an area to focus on and move forward and make progress. Yeah, and you know you can collect data on this if you're in this, especially in the software space like he is. You can see time to market. You can see the time between release versions. You can see how many bugs were addressed in the in the in the release notes. So you can actually track this and really see: Am I slow? Am I not bringing product to the market fast enough? Or I think a smaller percentage of the time, customers bring or companies bring products to market too early, and customers aren't satisfied, especially if they're paying for it, and you can piss them off. So you have to find that balance between it's. It's fast, right? But you're giving, again, this is notion of minimal viable product, right? You're making sure that you're giving people something of value and then you're fixing the bugs and fixing things right. along the way. But yeah, you know, the other way to put it that we've talked about is don't let perfect get in the way of good. Yep, exactly, exactly. Same idea. And I think it's always important to set customer expectations. You can do lots of things. You can, you can, you can garner lots of forgiveness if you set expectations properly uh, with your customers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and respond. Thank customers for their feedback. Apologize for any inconvenience, right, if there are bugs, and and, and move forward. So, yeah, I, I think responsiveness is really important. You're right. The last piece that I thought was great uh, with this talk was this idea of just start, fail, learn, right? That you can read books, and, you know, you and I are both readers, and this guy's a reader, um, and reading is great, but you're going to learn the most by actually getting out there and fail fast and learn from it. And there's, you know, we teach this, but this was a great example of that. It was really neat to hear his story kind of bring that philosophy to life. This was a great example of somebody who would just start, do things, fail, learn from it, and then eventually right, really enjoy some great success. So I thought it was a great interview. Great stories. Yeah, I agree, Mike. Shall we wrap this one up? Sure. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it was another great podcasting adventure from our side. We hope you agree. Uh, we hope you will found the last hour interesting and thought-provoking. Um, and, and as a way of wrapping it up, we'd like to once again thank our sponsors, Phillips Lytle LLP. Uh, if you need good, solid advice starting, funding, or selling a business, whether you're a single-person startup or working on a nine-figure exit, Bela and I can confidently recommend the attorneys at Phillips Lytle. Bela, what's the best way for listeners to get in touch with them? So best thing to do is reach out to Rich Honan, who is a partner at Phillips Lytle, and you can reach him at 518-618-1225 or with email at rhonan at phillipslytle.com. And of course, you can find his contact information in our show notes. Thanks for joining us this week. If you have questions about what we've discussed today, suggestions about future topics or potential guests that you'd think would be great on this on the podcast hey we would love to hear from you get in touch with us our email is bela.and.mike at gmail.com and if you haven't already done so please do subscribe to the podcast it's free and we have lots of great guests in the pipeline so until next week signing off from upstate new york have a great week mike Thanks, Bela. Over here from uh, the other side of the Atlantic in Münster, Germany, I wish everybody an excellent week. Bye.